Welcome to Drinks Coach. Not sure what I'm doing with this one, to be honest. Um, just before we start, Vinesack, at Vinesack for any uh, conversations with me on social media or Drinks Coach UK or lowercase. You can also reply in the uh, pull down below. Information on the wines will be there also. And press uh, subscribe, hit the bell if you want updates. Um, two a week, wherever I can. I had a week off last week, but uh, back in the game. Um, yeah, three white wines. What do they have in common? They're white burgundies. Now, without the aid of a map, I thought about this. I was thinking about having a map printed, which in some ways would have been helpful. But at the same time, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible and trying to simplify what white burgundy is all about down to its barest bones so you don't have to remember names and numbers and A roads and N roads and hills. Right, what we've got here, we've got three white wines, all from the region of Burgundy. How am I going to describe this? Okay, top of Burgundy, it's kind of below the bottom of Champagne. Let's start in Paris, okay, let's start in Paris. You drive out of Paris, an hour and a half out, or an hour out, you get to the top of Champagne, and then you go start going down a valley, which basically doesn't stop until you get to the bottom of France. You go down that valley, you go past Champagne, the first thing you reach, which is still technically Burgundy, is called Chablis. We've all heard of Chablis. Chablis is a region which is famous for its white wines, much mimicked all over the world. What's special about it? Well, it's the soil, okay? And the soil actually of all of white Burgundy is pretty important. And it certainly is essential to t telling the story from top to bottom. But there was just a load of shellfish, uh, which then turned into chalk, very deep chalk, in the region of Chablis, right at the top, uh, which we call Kimridgen chalk. Uh, and there's also lesser soils around it, which we describe as Jurassic stone, uh, from the Jurassic period, hard stones. Um, so there's Chablis up there. Then around Chablis, there's a bit of Sauvignon Blanc grown, uh, Sauvignon Saint Brie. Uh, people don't know that, but there is some there. Um, there's a little region which makes red and white wines. Uh, no, actually, no, I think it's just red wines. But in really hot years, it can be an absolute steal. It's called Irancy, and that's in that still area. Uh, which we call the Cote d'Auxerre, Cote d'Auxerre. And there's even Chardonnays around Chablis, not in Chablis themselves, which are really quite fine. And as um, global warming takes hold, these regions, which were considered lesser areas, which never really got ripe enough to produce really grand vin, are now producing really excellent wines. So much more important than it used to be. And you'll see that in the price of Chablis. Chablis is going through the in roof. Um, when I was um, a buyer back in the day at supermarkets and before then, uh, everyday Chablis was six pounds, five or six pounds. Everyday Chablis now is 20, probably. Um, things change, but then I get older. Uh, I keep on forgetting how old I am because I'm old. Um, so you then drive further south from Chablis and you're in the meat and bones, the meat and potatoes, the tenderloin of Burgundy. The top bit, Cote de Nuit, mostly famous for red. There's very few white wines in the Cote de Nuit. And then there's another bit called the Cote de Bone. So the Nuit Cote and the Bone Cote. The Bone Cote is famous for all the mega white wines. Things like Pouligny Montrachet, Merceau, which we've got one here, a very good one, in fact. Um, that region of the Cote de Nuit and the Cote de Bone, prized for incredible soils and aspects, is generally called the Gold Coast, Cote d'Or. Below that, you've got the Cote Chalonnet. And the Cote Chalonnet is a huge area, mostly making sparkly wine grapes, actually, if you think about it. But there are other areas within it which are quite good. And they've been marked out as special. Montagny is famous for white wine. Doesn't produce red in Montagny. It's not a red appellation. But you've got Rui, which can be a Premier Cru. Some exceptional limestone soils. Um, and Mercure. Mercure can be exceptional limestone soils, too. And they make extremely good red wines there, too. Very fine. Punch way above their weight, in my opinion. Um, you've got Givry, um, I'm sure I've missed one out, but um, yes, uh, just, just to tucked in underneath Cote de Nuit before you get to the Cote Chalon is also a little place called Marange, which is also forgotten, but makes quite nice wine. So then you've got another gap, and then you're at the bottom of, of Burgundy, and you're in Macon. Macon is the very, very bottom of that long line, which we call Burgundy, which we administratively put together as Burgundy, but actually steps on the toes of Beaujolais coming north. Beaujolais is almost in the Northern Rhone, 
Uh, the wines of Beaujolais have as much in common with the northern Rhone wines made from Syrah from places like Ampuy as it does with southern red Burgundies made from Pinot Noir. And some of the wines turn out to be quite Rhone-like and some of them turn out to be quite Burgundian. If I was, if I was going to describe the great wines of Beaujolais, and some of them are great, is they start off tasting like Rhone wines. Stony, flinty, pumicey. They grow on incredibly complex oils. But as they get older, they become more and more like Burgundy and more perfumed. I think that's probably a good way to describe it. So... Let's just recap. Chablis at the top. Cote de Nuit, Cote de Bone, Cote Chalonnet, Cote Maconnet. And the Macon is where there was a village called Chardonnay. And this is really where we understand the word Chardonnay comes from. Chardonnay isn't actually a great variety. It's what we call a cultivar. There are many, many, many different clones of Chardonnay, all producing different results. But because of various reasons and for historical reasons, we can say, right, well, those that group of great varieties We'll call them Chardonnay. It's like orchestra. Uh, that orchestra is the London Sinfonietta. Yeah, but they're not all playing the same instrument. You get me? It's kind of it's kind of a cheat, really. And that's one of the reasons why Chardonnay has such complexity. Because actually, it's lots of mini varieties all planted together. If everyone was playing the violin, it would sound pretty dull. But there's a bit of bongo drums in there. There's a little bit of you know wind wood, woodwinds <laughs> or whatever else. So um, here we are with Chardonnay's great birthplace of white burgundy. And... Having described that journey, um, I haven't really given you an indication of quite how different the soils are on the, on, from the top to the bottom, or have I given you an indication of how far you've driven? Because you've done a good three hours in the car by now, uh, and a lot can change in three hours. So where should we start? Well, with that idea that, bo that the Burgundy is kind of a line, let's start at the top. Uh, we'll start with this. Um, the reason why I'm doing this, by the way, is... Um, some very kind donations from both Waitrose and Clementine Communications. Thanks, Clemence, for the delicious Chateau de Pomar Merceau, uh, which I've been waiting until this moment to show. Um, I just thought three, if I put three pins into the map of Burgundy, it'll give people some a slightly better understanding of what's sort of going on. So from right at the top, you're in Chablis. Now, Chablis, huge kind of monstrous chunk of chalk. Um, used to be underwater, obviously, because it's comes from shellfish um, and there are tiny oysters in fact Kimbridge and Chalk <clears throat> but there are different grades of Chablis you've got the lands at the bottom which largely were for grazing uh, and still there's lots of cattle producing extremely good um, cheese in fact there's a lot of ghost cheese produced in Chablis also um, and you've got Chablis Appalachian Controle which is certain slopes and then certain slopes which have particularly fine aspects are called Premier Cru slopes which is kind of a sweet spot between the wines having identity and tasting Chablis like but also having richness that allows the wines to age for a long time but there's also seven villages which are called Grand Cru which are Pimp My Chablis and in warm years Grand Cru Chablis is as ripe and as rich as certainly Merceau and Pouli Morichet and, and, and great white wines of the Burgundy further south are in cooler years. So, uh, what have we got here? Well, the first wine we've got is from a very good producer, but it's very much the lowliest of the of, of the lineage, which is called Petit Chablis. Petit Chablis technically tends to be grapes which are not grown on Kimmeridge and chalk, almost by definition. But there are actually strips of Petit Chablis here and there, above the Grand Cru's, for example, where maybe the chalk isn't that dense, uh, where some of the more volcanic soil has pushed through over years of erosion, um, and are very, very fine soils indeed. So don't totally dismiss Petit Chablis. If you've got Petit Chablis from a really good producer, and these fellows aren't bad, Seguino Bordet make fantastic wine, and this is from a very ripe vintage, 2018. So all things are going well for this lowly um, little kind of uh, childish, I suppose, Chablis. Um, let's have a little taste. Probably didn't know that Chablis is 100% Chardonnay, did you? Well, some of you did, obviously, uh, but not all of you. Um, pale in colour, um, all, all that soil, uh, particularly from more shabbly and Premier Cru shabbly soils, you almost get the smell of oyster shell. You get the smell that makes you go, mm, 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 I want some oysters or some lobster. And, and these wines have a minerality which allows them to go very well with really rich shellfish. Ah, oh, that wine's so pretty. 2018 was very warm. I remember the summer in England was pretty hot. That wine smells of freshly picked ocean melon. Um, the kind of orangey melon. Slightly funky, um, hint of apricot maybe. In the palate, soft, limpid. It doesn't have the density of really expensive Chablis or Premier Cru or Grand Cru Chablis, which is 
mouth puckering until the wine's had a chance to chill out. But this is a very, very pleasant wine indeed. And so it should be. Because white burgundy, and one of the reasons why I'm doing this show, is going through the roof in price. It's ludicrous. This is Petit Chablis from a good producer, granted. But Petit Chablis, 13 99 in Waitrose. You're not going to find much better under £14 in that entire region than this. That's a very pleasant wine indeed. But maybe just because it's got Chablis, Shabba on the label, that's maybe three or four pounds tighter than I want to be. Let's move on to the next wine. We've gone from Chablis, do you remember? Chablis, uh, which is the Cote Auxerre. Then we've got Cote de Nuit, Cote de Bone, Cote Chalonnet, and at the bottom we've got Macon. Where there's some very, very good wines, by the way. You may have heard of Puy Fuisse, for example, or Saint Véron. They actually kind of straddle what we call Beaujolais Blanc. This is from Macon Luni. Uh, which is probably the most well-known of the villages that are allowed to be called Macon anything. Uh, Macon Looney, this is from a brilliant producer, Florent Rouve, and this wine specifically gives a lot of indication of where it's from. It's actually got what we call a lieu d. It's got a name on it, which isn't kind of a technical crew, but it's what they probably call the vineyard there in Florent Rouve and their estate. So, it says, Les Crais vers Vaux, which means the chalks facing Vaux. And Vaux is the river that runs right down the side of Beaujolais. So we're down the bottom of Macon, facing Beaujolais, and it's grown in chalk. All very special things, which mean that although this is just a lowly Macon from Luni, and you can buy co-op Macon Luni for still under £10 probably in some supermarkets, this is 20 quid. This is kind of as good as Macon Luni is going to get. Pimp my Macon. I know I've used that excuse, that, that, that phrase already, but it is. Pimp my mackerel. Deep colour, beautiful green hues to it. What vintage was that again? It smells very ripe. Yeah, 2018 again. Crikey. It's so ripe, I almost don't think it smells French. It almost smells like um, maybe from Limoux, from the southwest of France, where some exceptional Chardonnays produced around the same sort of money, maybe slightly less, but this wine has incredible ripeness. There's almost a hint of dried fruit on the vine, maybe a hint of botrytis, where the vines, the grapes uh, shrink a little bit because they get a little bit of mould late on in the harvest. And they're picked very, very late, so you get this wonderful apricot -y twang to it. Oh, yeah. That's a very enjoyable glass of wine. It needs a bigger glass, if I'm fair. See, back to my trusty... Sulcum Gin Chalice, which I drink red and white burgundy out of. A glass this shape is perfectly suited for Chardonnay. You want Chardonnay to get underneath the tongue. You want it to have a round texture to it. Um, good Chardonnay like this has enough acidity to cope, but you want that roundness. You want room for the air to get into the wine and for the wine to breathe. Oh, God, three times better like this. Mm. Well done, Waitrose. That's worth 20 quid of anybody's money. Absolutely fantastic. And better than a lot of bog-standard co-op Mercos and Pouligny Morichets, which come from the very, very fancy area in the centre of Burgundy, the Cote d'Or. Do you remember? Cote de Nuit at the top. That's where the most expensive wines in the world come from. Domaine de la Romani Conti is a red wine that costs in excess of £10,000 a bottle on release. That's in the Nuit. And below it, in the bone area of Cote d'Or is where we find wines like this. Isn't that well dressed? Oh, it's got a deep punt as well. That's a beautiful bottle. This is from Chateau de Pommard. Um, the bank investment family, the Carabello Baum, bought this not that long ago. It's been through three owners um, over the last, I think, 20 or 30 years. Uh, and this wine is made using organic methods. I just think that's one of the most handsome bottles I've seen in years. So it should be. It needs a bigger glass, doesn't it? So it bloody should be. It's 70 quid. Yes, you heard me right. 70 pounds. Look at the colour on that. This is 2017. 17 was, I think, a really lovely vintage, in fact. Uh, and it had more precision in its acidity. It had frost, which made meant that the, the yields were very low down, but the concentration of flavour was up. <sighs> if you want to know why the whole world planted Chardonnay, you have to maybe just once in your life go out and buy something £50 plus just to see what the fuss is about because they're all trying to copy this. They're all trying to do what this wine is doing to me right now, which is giving me a little bit of a in the pants, making me very, very excited. 
It makes the hair stand on the back of my neck. It has a deep, 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 profound white peach and mineral fruit flavour. Oh, it almost makes you... It's, it's giving me a free song. It's almost like you've just come out of a cold sea. Amazing intensity and tension in the wine. It's a big wine. It's got flavour and texture. At the same time, it's taut. Like the high string on a Les Paul guitar or something. Nom, 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 nom. See, this was all about. If I do enough of these shows, then every now and then a lady like Clemence at Clementine Communications sends me uh, a bottle of something very special and, and it makes makes the week worthwhile, frankly. God, fucking delicious. Hang on. What with? Yeah, I thought you'd ask me that. Lobster. Lobster Thermidor. Um... There are lots of places you can go. You can go to Saint Jacques on the on St James's Street and go and have the Marco Pierre White Lobster, a bottle of Merceau like that. Ooh, you're in heaven. There you go. So I've explained white Burgundy as a long string. Just to reiterate, Chablis at the top, Cote de Nuit, Cote de Bone, Cote de Chalonnet, Cote de Maconnet, and then you're in Beaujolais. Bada bing. Pretty Chablis, thirteen ninety nine from Waitrose. The most delicious Mac on Looney for 20 quid. But don't drink it after this, because once you drink something like that, nothing's good enough. £70 of some of the finest white wine in the world. See you next time. Mm -hmm.